Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Mandrill, the best way to send transactional email from the people who make MailChimp. Sign up today at mandrill.com. And by SnapTerms, online legal protection made simple. Visit snapterms.com and enter the code TWIST to receive 10% off. And by Amazon Web Services, the fastest growing, hottest startups build their businesses on Amazon Web Services. Learn more at aws.amazon.com startups. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. And uh, let me bring out Mitch Kapoor, for, uh, the founder of Lotus. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. So you're the guy sitting at the keyboard there. At the keyboard, yeah. And that is 1966. 1966, and you're in Ojai, California. And what computer is that? That is a uh, control data G10 machine. It's a literally first generation computer from the 1950s, uh, built out of tubes, and it had 2,000 words of decimal memory. This is even before they were doing machines in binary. I mean, it was an antique even then, but it was great to learn on. And then I see there's a hood there, so you're obviously cooking hamburgers on yeah, top or the, something? The actual computer is, in fact, the thing with the hood on it that looks like an oil burner. The thing I'm sitting at is just the, uh, the input unit, is just, just the keyboard. So it was, it was that big. And so you're 15 years old there. When yeah. did you start seeing technology and computers as a career? Was it that moment? Uh, no, uh, although that's when I fell in love with computers. And that's when you know, it, I began to understand early access was extremely important. But the career thing came. Um, when I bought my Apple II in 1978. And I was in my late 20s, and it was before anybody took personal computers seriously as a business. It was still strictly a hobbyist thing. But I, and I was unemployed, and I had this very wandering career after college. I was a professional disc jockey and a meditation teacher and other things, just really not your standard career. But I'd always been in love with computers, and when these little cheap ones came out, I just bought one to play with. I didn't know where I was going. But the day after I bought it, I was hanging in a computer store, because remember, I was unemployed. And I saw another guy in his 40s wearing a suit, who was a doctor, buying his Apple II. And believe it or not, I went up to him and, and I said, sir, I'm a consultant, and I think I can help you with your problem. <laughs> I do not know where I got that kind of chutzpah. But he hired me for $5 an hour to write programs in BASIC to support his office practice. And that's when I kind of got, hey, this could actually be a career. I want to do more of this. And, Turning point in life. Never look back. And, and you, had you met Steve Jobs at that point? Or? No. I met, no, I was just like a, a complete nobody. And Steve yeah. Jobs was already a celebrity right. by then. I met him in the you know, late 70s, early 80s as I got into the industry. Um, when did you start Lotus? I mean, how did that even come about? So I had a very compressed apprenticeship. After having been a meditation teacher and so on, I was making up for lost time professionally. From the day I bought my Apple II, four years of consulting, I started my first company. Uh, I wrote some programs. I sold them. Uh, I went to work for a hot Silicon Valley startup. I was a product manager. I got two-thirds of an MBA and dropped out. That four years was my education. And Lotus came at the end of that. The IBM announced and shipped the personal computer. And that changed the landscape because it was a machine that business could take seriously. And I had worked with the guys who did the first spreadsheet, uh, VisiCalc, and had a bunch of ideas about next generation productivity tools, they weren't interested in working with me. 
uh, which is an interesting story in itself. I didn't have an MBA, I didn't have a computer science degree, I hadn't worked at any of the Valley companies, I had no credentials. I had just done a bunch of stuff on my own and that, that wasn't good enough. So I had no choice but to go start my own thing, at least that's the way it looked to me. And, and that became Lotus, and that became the Lotus 123 spreadsheet. And which, just as a matter of history, I know people don't know it, so first year sales in 1983 in today's dollars would be $124 million. It was the high growth company of the 1980s. And you started it, uh, you wrote it yourself? No, two of us did it. In modern day parlance, I would have been the designer and product manager, and Jonathan Sachs would have been the chief technology officer and, you know, and, and developer. And you get these things printed and uh, discs printed and you start selling them? Yes. Well, we had, by this time, this was like the third company that I had started. Yeah. And so I'd raised venture capital and we um, did not have Kickstarter. If only we had had Kickstarter. <laughs> you would have given no equity away. Well, we wouldn't have had to do a second round because the only reason we raised a second round is we didn't have working capital to buy the disk duplicating equipment to duplicate the diskettes and to do all the things that you need to do when you have a lot of orders. Companies go to Kickstarter these days for that. But so we, we um, had this very high growth company that we built in a big hurry. It was like putting the wings on an airplane while it's running down the taxiway and you just hope it's sufficiently bolted on by the time you <laughs> lift off the ground or you're in a lot of trouble. In this period of time in the 80s, um, the computers had yeah. nothing to do once you bought them. It was very little. You came with yeah. basic maybe. Um, right. And there was a lot of focus early on that this could be used. Of course, you did it for business and for accounting and spreadsheets. But there was a lot of talk from Gates himself yeah. and from Jobs um, about education was going to be the big sort of um, reason these things would get to the home. Yeah. It didn't actually do that well on an education front, or did it? I mean, no, it didn't do that well. Um, it, there were a few products that a bunch of people used. Where in the world is Carmen San Diego? I, I think that some people who probably grew up on, on, on those. But I think there were a couple things looking back. One is the machines were still expensive and difficult to use and limited in their capabilities. And there was no internet. There was no connectivity. It was. Um, and so the enabling infrastructure really wasn't there except in a very modest kind of way. And classrooms didn't have computers and no teachers in schools were familiar with computers at all. And so it was very much an uphill battle for education. Uh, a few early adopters, but not a mass market at all. So let's fast forward a little bit. Um, yeah. You've been um, with Kapoor Ventures or Fund? Capital. Capital, k -Poor Capital. And by the way, it's k -Poor, like OK, right. Right. or not k -Poor. OK, right. OK, k -Poor Capital. Um, you've done how many investments to date? So overall, probably in the last five years, uh, well more than 100, and probably 25 in, in ed tech. Uh, so we've had a sharpening of focus. So that last couple of years and going forward, we're now completely focused on, these are tech startups, hardcore startups, which also have uh, some kind of positive social impact commitment or element to them. So they're both about doing well economically and doing good in the world. So that's our screen. So there are some things in education, but not all things. Health, consumer finance, uh, some other areas. Uh, so 25 investments. It, what do you look for? Because you've got obviously great pattern recognition yeah. from you know, a couple right. of decades in the business. What do you think makes for a successful startup, specifically in technology, or, and even in general? So I've got a two-part answer. Yeah. Part A, some of the same things you look for. I admire the way you write so eloquently about this. I'm not just flattering you. If you're going to be a startup person, you really have to be a hardcore startup person. You have to be committed to it. Uh, you need to be rigorous, you have to experiment, you have to be intellectually honest, you have to be scrappy. It's a long list. So we look for all those things. In addition, because of our social impact focus, we ask a set of questions like if an, uh, a startup comes in, if this thing succeeds, 
is it going to close any of the gaps we see in society that we care about, gaps of access and opportunity in education or in healthcare? Is it going to level the playing field or not? And things, for instance, that like we just backed this great English language learning online curriculum that will be offered through schools. English language learners are the lowest achieving group in the public schools, and if of any, and if you, for understandable you know, reasons, but if you can apply technology to help them make up that gap, you're helping everything. And they have a terrific business model, too. Which is? Well, it's twofold. One is there is dedicated federal funding already in place called Title I to support this kind of work, and it's in fact underutilized. Uh, second, the Latino market, and this is a product that will go not just to students but also their families, is one of growing importance, as we saw in the last election, for instance. Right. And so there are big corporations that are interested in corporate sponsorship opportunities just to put their logo in front of, to endorse, to be associated with, just the way they sponsor things on public television. And that's a, uh, another funding stream. So this is a company called Plaza Familia. It's an example of something that is in, our, in the impact bullseye. Uh, what a great episode we're having. And I want to just pause for the cause and... Um tell you about Mandrill. Mandrill is transactional email from the fine folks over at MailChimp. <laughs> they have servers all over the world and delivery is instantaneous everywhere. Amazing real-time uh, analytics. You can monitor performance and they've got great mobile apps on iOS and Android so you can actually see the troubleshooting and the performance of your emails. Oh, some people ask me, what is transactional email, Jason? You're talking about Mandrill, you're talking about transactional email. What exactly is that? Those are the emails that are the lifeblood of your system. That's when somebody resets their password. That's when somebody gets a friend request. That's when somebody gets a follow-up comment. That's when they get an order, when they get a receipt. All those important things, those are transactional email. Those are the lifeblood of your system. You cannot afford to not have those be fast. They need to, when you order something at a register and they say, would you like a receipt by email? You need to get that in your pocket before you leave the store. And that's what Mandrill is going to allow you to do. But they do a lot of other interesting things like split testing here, A-B testing. And A-B testing is something that, hey, listen, that's been in MailChimp for a while, but they're the first people to put it into transactional email, which means you can say, hey, let's test this version of people resetting their password versus this version of resetting their password, which one gets into people's inbox, which one works better, which one has a better open rate, you get the idea. And then it automatically will send the rest of the emails to that person. So you want to test your emails, right? It's not enough to just send them. You want to make them effective. Maybe the language in one of them is confusing. Maybe, maybe there should be more language. Maybe there should be less. Images, no image. You get the idea. A-B testing built in now. It's fantastic. And the pricing is incredible. 12,000 emails a month are free and will always be free. After that, you pay on a usage basis and you never pay for more than you use. So some of these email companies, they try to like get you to pay a monthly fee and whether you use it or not, or maybe sign a multi-year contract. No, 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 no more of that. Hell no. I wouldn't send you to somebody like that and have you all of a sudden you're losing money and you're wasting money. No. There's no feature grading either. All features are available to all users, whether you're paying or not. Sign up at mandrill.com. Sign up at mandrill.com. Think of a man drilling, M-A-N-D-R-I-L-L, mandrill.com. Thank you, at Mandrill App on Twitter. What a great partner. And uh, let's get back to this amazing episode. Thanks, Mandrill. Uh, you mentioned yeah. access yeah. and bridging the gap there. Yeah. We've seen a tremendous amount of content and courses uh, become available for free. Yep. Uh, whether it's edX, Coursera, Udacity, um, and even uh, we'll have Linda here um, from lynda.com, modest uh, fees, $25 a month. It feels like access to information thanks to the internet and thanks to MIT, Harvard, uh, and all these places putting all their content on for free. The access to the information has gone away. Is, is that true? Is, is that a fair statement? So some barriers have dropped and others haven't. So you talked about there are some barriers that have dropped. But what they're finding with the MOOCs is unless you're one of these incredibly highly self-motivated students, you're not going to finish. The completion rates are incredibly low. Most people need some combination of access to the information and some support, access to teachers, to faculty, to peers interactive exercises, other kinds of learning opportunities. So there's always some sort of uh, high-touch component as well as high-tech. 
And we think that's the formula that's needed to really improve learning outcomes. So in higher ed, the things that we think are, are interesting do have this component where the lectures are, are, are free and open, but there's also online mentoring and access to coaching, which can be done in a distributed fashion, leveraging the internet. It doesn't have to be done face to face. Uh, and if that's done in a way that is self-paced for the students, fits in with their lives, because lots of people trying to get college degrees also have lives, they've got kids, they've got jobs, they're doing it part-time. So if it works with that, then we think that combination of elements is really going to be effective in, uh, oh, and you can do that at a fraction of the cost of uh, college education today. That's, that's a winning formula. Let's segue into college education. Is it worth it today for, you know, <laughs> students to go, two-thirds of them, you know, take majors that do not apply to their eventual jobs, the costs, hundreds of thousands of debt in some cases, or tens of thousands at least. Is it worth it today, or do you think we're going to see a world in which parents, you know, see their children, it's already happening, get so in debt that they start advising their kids' kids, hey, maybe that's college isn't for everybody, you should be doing some, some other program. Yeah. I think we need to do a big rethink of all that. And one set of rethinking has to do with a four-year undergraduate liberal arts education, because a lot of parents are coming to the conclusion for what it costs and the debt and what students are getting, it's not a good value proposition. There's a huge amount of pressure on them. But you know, most college students, if you look at enrollment, that's not the situation there. And most people who are enrolled in college are working adults who are in school part-time to get a degree that is going to help them professionally. And there, that is still vitally necessary, but we need to bring the cost down, and we need to improve the quality and relevance of those offerings uh, dramatically, because the existing models of, let's say, online, for-profit higher ed 1.0, I won't name companies here, that's not working. Those are like subprime yeah, you're, mortgage mills. You're talking about Fe University of Phoenix specifically. I said I'm not going to name companies. I'll name it. I mean, but so I knew I could count on you. To yes. Do that, so. uh, you've got me again. Um, yeah. So, so yes. you, you, you yeah. see these University of Phoenix, yeah. there's a lot of people coming back right. with GI Bill loans, yeah. and maybe right. they take courses. They yeah. think those courses are actually right. going to right. get them a job. Right. They actually get them in debt and they That's don't right. help get a job. So that part of the system is broken, and the new alternatives will be ones that are at 10 or 20% of the cost. So for, it's, in fact, uh, and I, I, I don't want to be up here boosting uh, our own investments. I well, no, that. you invested in them for a reason, and we respect we your did. opinion. And, so. and yeah. it is that if you can bring the cost down of these self-paced, competency-based online schools, you can actually bring them in under the amount of tuition reimbursement you get from your employer if you work at a FedEx or AT&T or other large employer. And therefore, it is, in fact, free to you. Wow. And that is an irresistible proposition um, to get an undergraduate degree or an online MBA. And these are from accredited schools. What, what, what is the startup you invested in? Tell us about it. So uh, we invested in a startup called University Now that owns uh, a school called Patton University, which has a physical presence in, uh, in Oakland, and they offer uh, the program that I was just talking about. And the uptake now in reaching out to corporate employees, frontline workers, and big employers is just remarkable. Uh, it's a good program. The, 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 the courses are a significant advancement in, in quality over what had, what had come before. But the value proposition that you can do this at your own pace and earn a degree from an accredited institution and not go out of pocket, that has never been possible before, literally. And so that's what is now, uh, they're on a, a steep, uh, beginning a steep enrollment ramp. What do you think of the, the skills-based approach? You have Treehouse, Linda, mm -hmm. and a number of other people pursuing, hey, let's just get you proficient in Photoshop. Let's get you proficient in Photoshop level two uh, or, you know, uh, statistics so that you can take this, you know, next level of Lotus 1, 2, 3 and yeah. just getting you those sort of badges along right. the way that can be easily applied to employment. I think that's a very important component to make it practical, to make your learnings and skills demonstrable. It's, of course, easiest in the technical fields when you 
start talking about the kind of competencies you need if you're in a service business, about communications and people skills and other things. It's doable, but we, we, we're not quite there with uh, the, the, the pedagogy yet. So that's all important, and we've made another investment in a, just recently in a company called Accredible that came out of the Imagine K-12 uh, education incubator that is intending to be a credentials platform mm. where regardless of which of any of those services you're learning from, you can put up proof of your own work there, samples of your work and your badge and get it authorized by who provided it. So you have something that replaces your LinkedIn resume or stands alongside of it, but it's actually showing what you know. Because that's going to be very important, we think, to employers. They don't want to hear you tell about what you know. They want you to show it. Yeah. And teachers, yeah. Um, how, how do you yeah. see teaching changing because of all this activity? What do you think teaching looks like in the next decade, in the decades after that? I, I, I want to go gingerly because I'm still up a learning curve on education, and there's a lot to learn there. But I'll give you an observation, which is that in, in, in blended learning environments, where some of it's online and some of it's in the classroom, maybe a flip model where you're watching the videos at home, and you're, that the teacher can, in fact, become more of a coach and a problem solver and an intervener to work with you or a group around areas that are particularly difficult or challenging. And so you take the rote routine stuff and put that onto the machine, which is infinitely patient and can uh, customize and adapt to use an individual, but you still very much need the human in the loop. And so that's what we need teachers you know, to do, and we'll continue to need that to do, need them to do. And if you were put in charge of, or let's say you were on the, the board of a group of people in charge of what to do with public school funding, and were given the charge of like, hey, reinvent education, yeah. where would you start? I mean. We, we're in this time period where people yeah. are seriously considering yeah. nuking everything. I was talking yeah. to one principal, um, yeah. one headmaster, and saying, wow, you know, we have parents who, we don't actually know if going to college is the right thing. We have parents who still believe that, some parents who don't. If we could get all the stakeholders to buy into another yeah. model, yeah. maybe there, we could actually have one emerge. But you have parents and teachers and a lot of constituencies there to, to actually agree. What, what would it look like if you could fast forward it? Well, I'm wary of grand designs and silver bullets, but I think we've learned some things in the past decade plus about what works and what doesn't work in education, public education. So there are a number of different high-performing charter networks. Not all charter schools are high-performing, so, uh, but not all of the high-performing ones like KIPP and Aspire and others, they actually work differently. They're not all cut out of the same... Uh, uh, mold, but yet they all take students who in their previous, you know, in, in the schools that they were going to, those schools were failure factories. And now these uh, uh, high performing charters are sending substantially all of the same kids to four year colleges. This says it's not the kids, it's the school. Yeah. Even when you've got poverty and issues with families and community dysfunction, even with so um, that says the trick is to understand what works in those schools and can you scale it across a whole urban district. And there do seem to be some commonalities. They all have very high expectations for kids. Uh, and in public schools, if you've actually been in an urban public school, you will know that not all of the teachers and administrators exactly have high expectations for kids. Some do, some don't. Um, they all provide a lot of support and resources for kids to succeed, but they hold them accountable. They typically have longer school uh, days and hours and weeks, and they have an administration and a faculty that is committed to their student success. The problem is that that's not how we operate our urban school systems, which have politics, they have interests other than kids, and changing those systems, just like changing our political system, is very difficult. But that's what we have to do. I'm saying we, in some sense, already know the answer, Yeah. some of the answers, but we have to bring it to scale. So that's the challenge. And it's not a simple new model insight. It's the hard work of building 
human institutions that really serve the people's interests, serve kids' interests, serve all kids' interests, regardless of where they come from and what their families are like, that says every kid can succeed and get an education and be productive. And our job in society isn't complete until we organize ourselves to support that. And we just got to get over everything else. Hey, let me just take a moment and thank Snap Terms for sponsoring This Week in Startups. It's just the easiest way to build um, your terms of service and privacy policies for your startup. And if you forget to do this or you don't do it or you put it off, you know what? You're a knucklehead. You need to have this on your service or else you're going to get sued to oblivion. There are ambulance-chasing maniac attorneys out there looking for a startup, especially one that's maybe funded, and they try to do these class action suits and just try to get a settlement out of you. It's really abhorrent. However, Snap Terms is not. They make it easy and affordable. There's no excuse because your terms of service are going to start at only $299. If you're to hire a law firm to do this, some big law firm, you might spend thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars to craft these. You'll be on the phone with attorneys, and it's unnecessary, and it's expensive. And you can go just fill out uh, a survey there. Explain what type of service you're using, and then after you click a couple of boxes, it tells you, hey, here's what your terms of service should be, and if and I use it myself, obviously. We uh, use it at thisweekinstartups.com slash legal. Uh, they do funny ones, too. They'll put a little bit of like sort of plain English in there to make it funny so it, people can uh, read it and pay attention. Uh, but they have custom solutions for more complex issues, and if you use the promo code TWIST, you get 10% off the amazing affordable prices already. Snap terms, there is no excuse for you not to use it. There's no excuse for you not to have a privacy policy or a terms of service. If you're going to do a startup, do it right. Protect yourself, protect your employees, protect your investors, because I might be one of those investors. You better protect yourself and have a terms of service. I don't want to get a call from some company I invested in that, oh, we've got to put our terms of service up and uh, we got sued, boss. What do we do now? Oh, we got to raise more money or, oh, we got to, you know. It's just noise and it's a problem. Get your terms of service cleaned up. Get your privacy policy cleaned up. I know there's some of you who are listening right now, and you still haven't done it. This is basic 101 entrepreneurship. Go do it. Go to snapterms.com, put in your credit card, and have that terms of service up before this episode's over. Okay? Can you just go do that for me? And thank at snapterms on your Twitter account. Really appreciate the support from you guys over at snapterms. Let's get back to the program. Five uh, decades into technology, yeah. what has yeah. exceeded your expectations? <sighs> And what do you look at with great frustration and say, my God, you know, and when you were hanging out on panels, and there's some incredible videos on YouTube of Mitch and Jobs and Gates, you know, on panels together in Hawaii and other places that are in the Steve Jobs book and great stories. But what did you think would absolutely have actually been accomplished with technology that hasn't been? Well, so, you know, I, I, I still think that devices in this class, whether it's iPhone or Android or a phone or a tablet, they are just amazing. They're really a fruition of and, and even beyond what we imagined, even though they still have a long way to go and they're going to change. And these are like millions of times more powerful than the PCs I started out on. And they're so much more useful for the, all the kinds of things that they do do. That, that's all great. On the other hand, what's frustrating, I'll say there's a couple, two things that are frustrating me in particular. One is, believe it or not, I routinely still find computers hard to use. And we're talking me here. Um, my wife's credit card got hacked over the weekend. Free to put your hand up. My partner in life and in work and 51% of my intellectual capital from Frida. <laughs> but, and we, I'm going to leave out all the interesting details of the story, but um, somebody got the credit card and created a bogus eBay account and was buying iTunes gift cards because they're redeemable. Uh, and I sort of tracked this down. It was impossible to report this problem to eBay. I spent an hour on their support help site and on the phone. And I'm going, why is this so difficult? And, and I don't mean to pick on eBay. It's just what, what happened recently. But everybody is still frustrated by this stuff. And so we still have a long way to go. And Siri, I won't use Siri because it's too frustrating. <laughs> I want it to be Did better. You, you, we, but we thought speech recognition would be here by now, certainly. Well, it is as long as you, I have found Working my, my trick. My trick, do not use any proper nouns. Only use common nouns, ones with a lowercase. It is virtually perfect on my iPhone for doing texts and emails as long as I don't use any proper nouns. But let me tell you the other thing that hasn't worked well. The law of unintended consequences that 
I was around at the beginning of the internet. I played a kind of small supporting role in a number of technology issues and you know, helped found, co-founded EFF, Electronic Frontier Foundation. The openness and decentralization of the internet is a wonderful thing. It's empowering to individuals and groups and I could sing its praises. It has also created an ungodly and deepening series of messes which nobody really has a good idea of how to fix, both in terms of my little family eBay problem that I talked about, there's just the lack of security, the craziness of passwords and maintaining, that's just totally broken, and the fact that in order to have any reasonable national security, we have this crazy, <coughs> opaque, non-transparent surveillance, because they felt that they had to. The part of the core, I mean, there's a political issue there for absolute sure, but part of the core of all this is that the internet is full of holes like Swiss cheese. It was never meant to be the backbone of a global civilization of six billion people. And now we're seeing increasingly how screwed up it is. We don't know how much they know about us. We have no idea. And it, I'm not a paranoid guy, but it makes me nervous. Whether the they is the NSA, or whether it's the NSA's backup, that's China, where they back up everything the NSA collects in, in China, <laughs> or whether it's uh, a set. I, that is the deal, isn't it? Yeah, um, apparently. You know, or whether it's a variety of bad guys, from petty criminals to you know, global cri you know, criminal syndicates that are conducting all their business and doing horrible things with uh, exploiting children. And so we need to figure out how to preserve the good things, the great things. Because yeah. the, the, the temptation is going to be to shut it down, to close it up. This would be very bad. But we can't just let it kind of go the way it's going. So that's and when frustrating. You, frustrating. When you frustrating. look at frustrating. what's happening, I mean, I know, I, I know it's an education conference, but yeah. we have you here and yeah, you a, did co-found the EFF. When you look at something like this, what's going on with Snowden, what's going on with the NSA prism, sure. and what yeah. we don't know, yeah. Is this the business that America should be in of collecting this much data on its citizens? Or is this something that, you know, they say there's oversight, but we don't yeah. know the oversight, yeah. so then that doesn't feel like actually oversight to me. Right. I mean, the just trust us argument is very un-American. Uh, it, it really is, historically, that there ought to be more transparency and more openness and more robust debate about what is to be collected and what isn't, and more public debate about what is and is not an appropriate level of oversight. So I don't know where it should come out, but I know that our process has been terrible and unacceptable. And literally, we don't know how bad it is. So EFF was involved in working with this AT&T whistleblower a few years ago, who was the person who said, that the government has a tap into everything that goes across AT&T. And I thought to myself, well, if it's AT&T, it's probably everybody. Yeah. I mean, why would it be just AT&T? And I sort of filed that away. And now it's coming out, well, they're certainly collecting all the metadata on every single call. They're collecting full information about everybody who is outside the US, does that mean if I travel outside the US and I'm using my Gmail that they have full access to all my mail? I don't know that that's not the case. I suspect it probably, we just don't know. And that is not, the, the, the government is accountable to the people. And there should be narrow exceptions that for national security when there has to be so much secrecy that they can't even tell us what they're doing and how they're doing it. And we need to do a reboot on this. And what do you think the role of technologists yeah. and, the, and the morality yeah. is in, in all of this? You come as a yeah. meditation teacher and as a <laughs> child of the 60s, you yeah. know, and yeah. you yeah. know, you and Steve and Gates yeah. and, and a lot yeah. of great folks, Waz, yeah. sort of built this industry and now we're seeing something yeah. different. You know, it, it's not the radicals, the hippies, the, the free thinkers, it's capitalists and maybe people are even they seem to be um, more than willing to participate in these things, whereas maybe your generation of technologists weren't. Well, it's been interesting to me to watch how profoundly uncomfortable Mark Zuckerberg and Larry Page got when PRISM came out, mm. because they had been compelled 
to engage in a certain kind of cooperation with the government that I think they really didn't want to do and compelled not to talk about it, not to acknowledge that they were doing that. So that was clearly over the line for today's generation of technology leaders. And Google has filed a suit asking at least just to be able to talk more specifically about what they're doing. So I think that in all generations, back then and now, the leaders in the industry had a very complicated mix of motives that are partly idealistic, partly pragmatic, and partly Darth Vader. Um, <laughs> and the mix changes from company to company and from time to time, but I still see that going on as they wrestle with it, only now the stakes are completely global, which was not the case back in the 80s. So if you're sitting in the boardroom of, it doesn't matter, Apple, Facebook, Google, or any one of the big companies or a senior executive, you know, you're, you're playing for big stakes. What you do isn't just affecting, you know, five or 10 million nerds and geeks. It's everybody and everything. And that's a pretty serious responsibility. So I hope that drives people in the direction of growing up quickly and taking understanding that they have a responsibility not just to their shareholders but to their user community which is basically the world and to everybody to be responsible now the hard part is what does it mean to be responsible does it mean to cooperate with the government when does it mean you stand up to the government and say as google has said with this suit that we need some relief here this is you're not you're not playing by a set of rules that we think you ought to play by and they're 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 struggling with it there's, there's Snowden, yeah. Bradley Manning, uh -huh. Heroes, something else. I mean, how, how do you look at these whistleblowers in another era, you know? Well, I, was, I, I thought you might ask that question. So I'll, I'll tell you, I have when I saw that Snowden has this picture going around the internet of him and his laptop, and the laptop top has a big Electronic Frontier Foundation sticker on it. I feel like the facts of what he and others have brought out are terribly important. But at the same time, I don't think, I don't think he's a hero. I just, don't, I just don't feel that. I wish, what I mostly wish is that our government hadn't done the kinds of things that causes people like Snowden and Bradley Manning to feel they have to do the things that they do. And I'd like to take it all the way back uh, to how do we have a government, and I think partly it's at this point in my life I know personally some of the people who are on the government side of this and I know how they think and what they're doing and I can't see them as just evil but I do see them consistently making not the right decision. And we need to fix that. And until that gets fixed, and hopefully in an open and democratic way, there are going to be, I actually hope that there are the people who, by their own lights, have the courage to stand up and show what's going on. But what would actually make me happy is if they never had the need to do that to begin with. So and it's complicated. I'm still trying to parse yeah. it. Obama yeah. um, was supposed to be changed. You yeah. know, you're, I'm fairly certain you're a pretty big supporter. I am. And um, a lot of uh, yeah. folks in the tech community are big supporters. Yeah. And when, they, yeah. when you see this, yeah. Yeah. this is a disappointment, no? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would say that the stance on these issues is at the low end of performance. I think the stance on standing up around climate change and what he just did is too bad it got buried with all the other news about regulating uh, emissions from <clears throat> power plants is, is courageous and is really you know picking a fight with the right people and I think he's serious about it. Um, I will say though I have a much better understanding having spent 
I think this is sort of my third, it's not a tour of duty in Washington, D.C., but I go back often enough and I'm on the inside of meetings. There are such limitations to what any elected official, including the president, can do. I mean, from the point of view of a startup where you can just make a decision pretty yeah. much. I mean, it might be a good decision or a bad decision, but you know, you can go do it or try to do it. And it's just the opposite of it, that it's a system that has become sclerotic, has become divisive. We're supposed to have checks and balances, but now we can't get anything done. And the problems we have are larger than what a President Obama or any politician can fix. And that is true and almost unbearably sad. So circling back um, to education and yeah. also just this divide we're seeing in society. I'm glad you got to that. Um, you know, there's a lot at stake now. Yeah. Polarization of wealth, unemployment, deflationary job environment on a global basis. Are, are you hopeful for society or are you scared to death at this point? Yes. <laughs> And I'll break that into two parts. Yeah. Um, starting with the latter, particularly in this country where uh, economic inequality is at the highest it's been in what, a century? So that the, the gap between the haves and the have-nots is continuing to increase and is in some ways getting locked in, locked in by a crazy tax system locked in by the ways big corporations have gamed the system with regulations, locked in to some extent by a sense of entitlement that people have who have made it, thinking that they got there entirely on their own merits, even though everybody has gotten where they've gotten by getting some help, only some people have more access and some people have less. That's all profoundly disturbing and needs to be uh, 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 arrested and, uh, and changed. When you look globally at the fact that a billion people have been lifted out of abject less than dollar a day poverty and we're on our way to the next billion, you have to go on a scorecard, hey, not bad. I mean, there are, if you look in the, the, the biggest picture of things, um, and there, the reason you ask me if I'm optimistic, I always think we can do better. I think people have a deep capacity to use what we've been fortunate enough to be given, including technology, for the betterment of everyone. But as I've said at another talk, people in the tech world, I would encourage to fall out of love with tech per se and think about how it's used and think about the difference that it makes or doesn't make, which is why I like ed tech, why I like gap narrowing ed tech. Because then there's really an opportunity to level the playing field, to give everybody a shot, to reverse some of the negative trends and directions that are so troubling. And frankly, at age 62, after you know 35 years of being at this day in, day out, that's the sort of thing that I can still get up excited about, that I meet with entrepreneurs and they have ideas and they're trying to do things and they're trying to make a difference and they're using this fabulous methodology of doing startups, which is kind of a Silicon Valley invention uh, that as a social, you know, as a means of creating value. I think coupling those two things together, that's the thing that still gets me out of bed. And this generation of yeah. entrepreneurs, yeah. specifically yeah. millennials, yeah. they're very purpose-driven, very yeah. cause-driven. Do you think that that will lead to great success uh, as entrepreneurs? Or, you know, the sort of, a lot of the technology-driven folks were kind of cutthroat. I mean, you worked with Gates a lot during the cutthroat period of life. Obviously, now you talked about the billion people being lifted out of poverty. He's a big part of that, isn't it? Isn't he? Yeah, they are very committed. The work that they're doing, uh, like on curing malaria and these large-scale problems that are solvable, uh, you know, a vaccine and getting it to people, that can make a huge difference. I think the Gates Foundation is less successful in education and some of these soft, squishy issues, but they're putting a lot of dollars to work where I think it, you know, in, in extremely important areas. Um, Wow. I, you know, I think there's always going to be cutthroat people. Yeah. I mean, we're not, we're not changing human nature. I think 
that the, the virtue of a, any democratic society where the people in general have the opportunity to set the rules is we can do that in ways that mitigate the worst excesses of human nature. Yeah. And we need to do that because asking people to act like angels, I don't know, that strikes me. I don't have that kind of but religious But is this generation missionary cutthroat thing. enough? Like, well, so here's... When you meet, I meet a lot of entrepreneurs for angel yeah, investing, and they, they just want to do good, but they don't want to actually build companies that really crush it. Well, here, here, you know, I see that. But I think, but I also see lots of hardcore entrepreneurs who are totally committed about making the world a better place. And how do you have both? I think entrepreneurship has gotten a little too fashionable. So in previous decades, you had young people coming out of college who wanted to go into investment banking or into consulting. Now they're going into startups. Uh, or they're doing their Teach for America stint. And I think Teach for America net-net has a ton of great things about it. But it has also become very fashionable. Um, and a lot of the people who drift into the startup world aren't doing it out of an inner sense of, and I can talk to you about this, because yeah. you've written about this, that this is their destiny to build something. Yeah. And I think if you don't have that level of commitment, doing a startup may well not be the right thing, because it is just too hard. Uh, I gave entrepreneurs bad advice for at least a quarter of a century, because I didn't understand how hard it was because Lotus, just statistically, it was an outlier. Yeah, we did, hard, we did a lot of hard work. It was good design. We did lots of things well. But the magnitude and pace of success owed more to circumstantial factors than some genius on my part. So you know, you go from zero to 150 million overnight. You go, well, this is pretty easy. So yeah. uh, the hard part started with worrying about screwing up once we had done that. But it, it just it turns out, and I apologize to everybody I gave bad advice at. You it's, just told them it's going to be easy. It's, well, I, Go I knew it. it was hard, yeah. but I didn't understand that you should really be prepared for profound difficulties along the way, along the journey before reaching the goal, because as we both know, that is much more typically the case than not, if you look at the companies that have been successful. OK, um, so. Mitch Kapoor, everybody. Yeah. Big round of applause. Uh, and maybe a couple of questions. We take maybe three questions from the audience. Um, hey, while we're getting a question from the audience, if you could just, a clear question would be great. Um, just ground rules for asking questions. You don't have to ask, hi, I'm a lawyer and my firm is this and we sell these services. Here's a question that is really about me. Just, let's, let's ask. I always ask that disclaimer. Um, so let's see, yeah, a question from the audience, uh, education or otherwise. And, um, okay, go. Hi, Mitch. How are you doing? Uh, you spoke about your own education. What do you think about the uh, apprenticeship model and it coming back as a form of like, education, in, in a sense? I think there are contexts in which the apprenticeship model, well done, makes a huge amount of sense when you are learning to do something. And I think apprenticeship models for programming, in particular, can be very uh, effective. I, I know of a couple. and. Yeah, I think they can be a really wonderful way of le learning a craft or a skill, you know, in situ under real world conditions. So, yes, apprenticeship. It seems like the apprenticeships um, are kind of out of favor because everybody's getting sued for unpaid internships these days. Oh, well, you can't. You have to do it right. I didn't have, I, I like, I'm working on doing short answers. Yeah. Not, not succeeding. But they have to be paid. They have to be paid. Paid apprenticeships. Paid by apprenticeships. Who? By the person learning or the person getting the apprentice? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Groupon has done a successful apprenticeship program where they, they pay people. They pay people enough. There's a pro it's a balance. There's a prospect of a, of a job. I think you can't just make people pay out of pocket. Right. It, the value prop has to be real. It has to be a worthwhile investment. You may ask the person doing the apprenticeship to make some level of investment, but you can't. See, when you have unpaid, people who have to work for a living or are helping support their families are excluded. And so that is just winding up increasing the have-have-not gap. And so, but um, 
Tom's Shoes, we talk about that a lot. They have figured out a model for selling shoes where they give half of them away free because every time you buy a pair, they give away a pair. The thinking about business models of how you have multiple tiers, multiple pricing, different pricing to different channels, how you cross subsidize, how you can work with networks of nonprofits to give free app store codes for your education app that you charge for. I think we can't be intellectually lazy. We should start with the assumption that there's a way to do it and awesome. then find it. Next question. Hi, uh, Mitch, quick question. Uh, you mentioned Where's Squishy color? way back here in the back. Yeah. Could you get a little bit more defined when you talk about uh, Gates Foundation as others making investments in things that are squishy like education, but the results yeah. don't compare to maybe something hard like solving a vaccine issue in science? Yeah. Sure. Um, I'm going to do the, I am attempting to do this in a way that is polite, respectful, but incisive. See how I do. Uh, having known uh, Bill Gates for mm, at least 30 years, I would say Bill has a unique uh, skill set uh, uh, analytically and the breadth of his knowledge, but his interpersonal skills and his understanding of human nature, I would not put up in the top quartile. Um, <laughs> And the foundation is very much a reflection of, of his interest, just the way that companies reflect their founders. Yeah. So when they have done things in education, they have a lot of fabulous people working in the Gates Foundation in the education area, and they're doing many good things. But there's still a tendency to want to do things that involve measurement, analytics, hard algorithmic things. And the fact of the matter is that the education of human beings is fundamentally still has a piece of it that's an art, that's human, that's not reducible to algorithms. I have a bet with Ray Kurzweil about whether it will be or not. <laughs> so if your, your kind of organizational DNA is tipped over to the algorithm side, you're just going to struggle more when the domain that you're in isn't susceptible to that. And I would say in a different kind of way, and I admire what Google is doing, and I'm watching them now grapple. And this is, can I say anything here or just be general? No, okay, thank you. Um, the, uh, their head of people ops analytics said, we have figured out that test scores and GPAs, I can tell you this because it was publicly quoted, are absolutely not predictors of job success at Google, and so we don't use them anymore. Well, great for that. It's now 15 years into Google when they've been throwing people out of the process the whole time because they didn't go to the right school, they didn't have the right test scores, and they didn't have the right GPA. So it is, this is one of the things about the tech community is, you know, we were all kind of nerds and, and geeks and good at math and stuff and that's what we're comfortable with and that's the mindset that we've brought to the whole world. But they're now, I'm glad after 15 years Google is figuring this out. They need to take a different approach and they'll use big data to analyze it, but it's not to, 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 to have a hire and who's going to be successful. And so the challenge for the billionaires and their, their big world-changing foundations is to match up their skill set against the problem so that there's a good match, or to expand the skill set so it's a good match for the problems and issues they're, they're taking on. Awesome. Final question. Yeah. Uh, I teach at a Canadian university, and when the Patriot Act was passed, we stopped allowing any student data to be stored on, on servers in the United States because we assumed that all this kind of stuff was going on. There, you know, the Patriot Act said there was no oversight. And so I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about uh, special impacts of the surveillance program on education. I think we now know enough to know we profoundly don't know what we know. We do not know the extent to which there is surveillance or data collection, what's been collected, by whom, for what purposes, where is it used, what's the level of oversight, and that would absolutely include education data of all kinds. And so at this point, it's a once burned, twice shy, I think, being concerned, nervous, and aggressive in pursuit of, 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 of clarity and disclosure right across the board, top to bottom, everywhere. If now is not the time when that is justified, I cannot imagine when there would ever be a time when it's justified. It now is the time. 
Awesome. On that note, Mitch Kapoor. Thank you. Well done.